Velkommen, og værsgo til plads igen. David fra New Zealand vil nu åbne vores øjne til the world in your little your little pose there is there is a new booklet and this little booklet are quite new this is from today and this is the booklet that the follow will give some good words some drinks and snacks after the conference. David has just been at a conference in Hammer, Norway, and is, he's on his yearly traveling around in the world for to tell about strategies for good inclusion. And you'll introduce yourself, and you have 45 minutes and uh, you need maybe 70 or 80 point more time more but we will be strong and after 45 minutes i will got it welcome david in the manner in the we in the rail tenakoto Tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. <laughs> right. That was a Maori greeting, a sincere Maori greeting too. Um, it acknowledges three things. One, your important work that you are doing here in Denmark and other countries, Sweden and Norway particularly. It acknowledges what tribes you come from, what countries, what also your language, and uh, I'm very hopeful that you can understand my English as well as being able to adapt to your various other languages in um, Scandinavia. Um, and welcome to you all, and to which you should respond, as Lena did, um, with the words kia ora. So, uh, run them together. So can you just practice that? Kia ora? Kia ora. Kia ora. So that's the acknowledgement when um, a Maori person or somebody else like myself gives an introduction. So thank you for that. Um, I'd like to thank very much Ula. Where are you, Ula? Down there. Okay. Um, for inviting me and for being my mentor, really, in this part of the world and organising... Uh, various engagements for me, including last year one in uh, the Faroe Islands, which was a fascinating experience. Um, so thank you for that. And also uh, to uh, Thomas for um, arranging uh, or contributing to the arrangements in Hamer last, last week. And both of you for um, editing and tempting me to write a short book. <laughs> Um, which I'm going to try and make even shorter in the remaining 40 minutes that I have with you. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to make you uncomfortable. My, my job is not to make you, go, make you feel good at the moment. I'm sorry, after lunch you might be sort of feeling very content, but I'm going to make you feel a bit discontent. And I, but I hope that towards the end... Um, I will help you to feel more comfortable. So let's have a look at it. Um, you may know that uh, most of my writing has been focused on children with special needs arising from disabilities, and um, I've published quite a bit in that area some of you will be familiar with. I'm now broadening my focus to look at the whole range of disadvantaged children. And I'm hoping that you will um, consider to broaden your own interest as well. So we're going to be looking at ethnicity uh, differences. And we're living in a world 
where we have super, div super diversity. We're becoming more and more diverse ethnically. My country, your countries as well. Um, then we'll look at something that's even more important than ethnicity, and that is socioeconomic status or class. And uh, we'll look at the really poor performances of children from low socioeconomic status class uh, 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 homes around the world. We'll be looking at gender differences, um, boys and girls, and I'll elaborate on that. But let's not forget also within gender differences we have the emerging challenge of LGBT children, um, particularly their proneness to anxiety and depression and at risk for suicide in many of our countries. So we mustn't forget that. We'll also look at, uh, no I won't do that much today, but just in passing I should mention we've got religious diversity. I'm not sure to what extent we have that as a challenge in your countries, but if we take a country like Northern Ireland, for example, I read just a couple of days ago that only 10%, 1 in 10 kids, are in integrated classes. So we have a separation of Protestant and Catholic children, I think, to the mutual disadvantage of both groups. So religion, and of course we have differences in ability, um, and I'll be talking about all of these in a bit more detail. I'll be outlining some of the challenges that are facing us, and I'm talking about these challenges as posing a crisis. We are not doing enough. We are failing around the world in accommodating to diversity. We have a crisis on our hands and I'll give you some of the data from my own country which I think would be replicated as well in many of your countries. So <clears throat> that will be the first part of my talk and the second part will be um, to say well what can, no, no, not what can, what should we be doing about that? So that's where the light might appear at the end of the tunnel. Okay. <clears throat> um, in the, the book, uh, I'm not quite sure how that's been translated in, um, in your country, in Danish. It's been published in Denmark last year. Um, and this was part of my conclusion. And it's the, the, the basis of what I'm talking about today. So let's read it through. It's an indictment, that's a criticism, on our politicians and educators, that's us, that underachievement and discrimination among diverse learners has been tolerated. It has gone on and on and on. It has been tolerated for so long. Why? Why do we put up with it? It need not be the case. We know enough about its causes and about the remedies, yet we continue not to take effective action. Such dereliction of our duties towards the most vulnerable of our children must cease. So that's my basic premise that I want to convey to you today. Um, <coughs> I mentioned at the beginning that there are the five big areas, and you can see them there, um, what I'm referring to. But notice particularly that these areas all intersect. If we take ethnicity, ethnicity and religion relate to each other. Ethnicity and social class relate to each other, and so on. Can you see those arrows? I want to introduce a, a nice new word for you. It was new for me when I first looked at this in a bit more detail. Um, intersectionality. Have you heard that word? 
intersection, well, here, note it down. Interse it comes from the intersection, you know, in roads, you get intersection of streets. Here we have intersectionality. The basic argument I'm saying here is that you can't take just one of these, say ethnicity or gender, alone. You've got to look at how they relate to other variables. It makes things a little bit more complicated than perhaps we had thought of. And a good example of that comes through from Steve Strand, um, an Oxford um, uh, researcher, and he has looked very much at intersectionality. And his research shows that when you bring those various factors together, you get a big risk arising from the intersection of ethnicity, gender, and social class. When you get those three intersecting, you're getting a very risky combination. So that, for example, the lowest achieving groups in the UK are low socioeconomic status, black Caribbean boys. They're the lowest of the lowest. So if we're targeting efforts, if we're targeting resources, we've got to look at how those various factors combine. I'll leave that point. Intersectionality, a good word for you to take away. So let's begin with ethnicity. As I said at the beginning, we, as a result of migration and of refugees, confronting most countries of the world, we have an increasing diversity called by some writers, super diversity. We've got to begin to recognize that. My deliberate use of a Maori introduction to you, I think, is a beginning of a point I want to make. And that is, we must engender respect, as I hope my acknowledgement of my um, the presence of Maori in my community shows. So there's a, if we're looking at a way ahead, there's a word that we can hang a lot of things on. Respect. Respect. Okay. So looking at ethnicity, I'm going to give you some of the figures from New Zealand. It's not a pretty picture, let me warn you. Um, Let's have a look at this uh, graph. Um, I'm looking at four groups, as you can see here. The Maori group, I've already mentioned. We have a Pacifica group. These are children whose families have come from the Pacific Islands, like Niue, Tonga, Samoa, you know, those romantic sounding islands that you would love to visit um, on a cruise one day, um, who have right of entry to New Zealand through migration um, because of the rel special relationships. Then we have an increasing number of Asian families living in New Zealand, um, mainly from India and China. And then we have the European, my own background. I'm a fourth generation New Zealander, by the way. German, English, Scottish background, same as my wife, different families. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, we are referred to by the Maori and we self-identify as the word Pākehā. Can you say Pākehā? Pākehā? Pākehā. Yeah, yeah. That's another name for European. You would be, if you came to New Zealand, considered to be a Pākehā. Anyhow, so we've got data, fairly broad data, on those four groups. And then we've got information about three areas, um, we have uh, a system of national standards where we assess children regularly uh, according to their performance, whether it's well achieved, partly, well uh, achieved modestly as it were, and not achieved and so on. Okay, so if we look at those who have 
achieved above or at the national standards by subject. Let's take the Pākehā group first. There's their achievement in reading, about 90%, is it, you can see? 80, between 80 and 90% are achieving the national standards at or above um, from this particular group. Um, mathematics, a little bit lower, but fairly similar. Writing, just a little bit lower. Okay, so those are the three figures. Now let's jump to these two groups here. You can see the discrepancy, can't you? Pretty big, pretty major. You know, and, and the target really has to be, and this is what the government is aiming at, to increase both of these groups, Pacifica and Maori children, up to this level here. So they've got to get another 10, 20% of um, children in that, that category here. So there's one example um, of the discrepancy and I would welcome any comments later about whether you have a similar pattern in your countries here. Then there's this group here, NEAT. NEAT stands for not in education, employment or training. NEAT. And this is the group from 15 to 24. School is compulsory up to the age of 16, by the way. Some kids can leave school at 15 if they get special dispensation, but most leave school at 16. So we're dealing with this group here. And a very similar pattern to what I described earlier. You look, 20%, that's a lot of young people at home playing on computers, watching a video, hanging around on the street, getting into trouble, perhaps committing crimes, many of them depressed and say, facing mental health issues, either now or certainly in the future, if that is their life. So 20% of Maori children not in education, employment or training. A bit lower, but still quite high. What is that, 18%? So around about that, compared with the Pākehā, about 11%. Even those are a bit high, and, and Asian, very similar to the Pākehā. So there's a good example of NEAT. I've looked at the international statistics. I'm sorry I can't remember what your countries were, but we have a much lower number or proportion of NEAT kids in, or people, young people in the Netherlands. I think it's only about 5 or 6% of the population. So they're doing something right. We've got to learn from them. Um, let's look now at gender. I'm sure this applies to your countries. The difference between, I'm just going to look at boys and girls, I'm not going on to LGBT, I've already mentioned them in passing. Let's move on to look at them. Uh, we have the national standards and we're looking at the um, gender performance of them, uh, of children, boys and girls. Uh, the female along the top, we're looking at it from 2011 to 2015, the latest statistics that I could get. And you can see that roughly 80% or a little bit more of girls were reaching reading national standards. Boys, a little lower. Well, not a little, a big bit lower. As you can see, they're knocking around about the 70%, about a 10% difference. Now, that's a pretty big, significant difference to look at. Um, I'm going to show you <coughs> writing now. What do you think is going to come through there? Who thinks it would be similar to this pattern? Hands up, hands up. Those who think it'll be a different pattern, perhaps boys ahead of girls, anybody? Nobody, okay. So you think it'll be a similar pattern, you're right. In fact, if anything, the difference, as you can see, is a little bit bigger, all right? Now the next one I'm going to show you is mathematics. What's going to happen there? Who thinks it'll be similar pattern? Who thinks 
there will be boys are doing better than girls. Quite a few of you. Who thinks there will be no difference, or no significant difference? You're right. Look at them. See? So that is evidence at a point of time in one country. It is duplicated around the world. If we take your, one of your neighbours, Finland, who do very well on the PISA test, as you all know, and you, some of you think that you'd like to get up there, there's a big difference between boys and girls, similar to this here. So the PISA results for Finland that put, put them in the top ten, in top five, is a result of girls achieving better than boys. Okay, one more graph um, to give you some America, American profile here. This is looking at the number of people who um, take a bachelor's degree in America. It looks at the differences that have taken place between 1971 and 2006. And as you see, look here at the most recent figures, females well ahead, these are hundred, uh, these are in thousands, 800,000, 900,000, a million, etc. Um, you can see that females are well exceeding males in taking up graduate degrees. Okay. If we go back to 1971, it was the reverse of that. So something has happened in that meantime. Is it women's liberation? Something like that. Um, the crossover was around about 1986. So. That's all I'm going to say about that. We've got to look at how we arrest those trends, how we reverse them in some cases. Or do we just say, too bad? It's not genetic. It's not the way the brains are developed. It's to do with something in our cultures that impacts on those figures. Now let's look at socioeconomic status. Let me start with a story of a little boy who um, was brought up in a family uh, where both parents left school at the age of 13 without any qualifications. Um, no books in the family, no books in the home. And it goes back to some time, there was no TV, not many, no families at that time had TV. There was a radio. Um, the father had a saying, children should be seen but not heard, therefore discouraging language. Okay. That boy um, grew up and eventually went to university and one day he came and talked to people here in Denmark. <laughs> Um, that little boy is still in me. I'm still there. It's still there. I can still remember my early experiences. Uh, the question is, how does that little boy succeed? Succeed against the odds, perhaps? That little boy had the great benefit of good teachers. And... There's one word that comes out of that experience of the good teachers. And this is a, another critical word. I gave you another a word to begin with, respect. This word, I wonder if you can guess what it is. What did these teachers do that helped this little boy to develop, to become ambitious? The word begins with E. Yeah. Encourage. Pardon? Encourage. Encourage. Yeah, of course that was the case. Anything else? Yeah. Trust. 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 Yeah, that's a good one too. Any others? Yeah. They have faith in you. Mm -hmm. Good. The word I've got, and I, I like all of those, expectation. Yeah. You think of your teachers and the people around you that have helped you to succeed 
And I would guess that one of the common denominators is expectation. Expectation for performance, for development, conveyed very simply. I can remember Miss O'Grady, my early child, sorry, my primary school teacher, sort of expecting me to be able to decipher these squiggles and be, re be a reader, become a reader. I can remember her expecting me to learn my times table by the age of seven, all the 12 times table, you know, those ones. She expected that. No concessions to the fact of my family background or anything like that. Expected. And then, well, I can go through naming other teachers who linger in my memory. So, socioeconomic status, let's move along. Um, Robert Putnam, in, uh, a United States scholar, he talks about the most important divide in America is class, class, or socioeconomic status. Not, not race. You know, race gets a lot of prominence, but really he says, with good evidence, class. And it's the place where class makes a big difference is in the home. Okay. Um, United Kingdom, they say that research there shows that social class is the strongest predictor of educational achievement. If we look at the OECD data, students from low socioeconomic state, status backgrounds is, are twice as likely to be low performers. Very serious stuff, isn't it? So socioeconomic status is a factor which we've really got to look at. You know, how do we compensate for some of the disadvantages that children from low socioeconomic status have? For example, there's good research to show that if we look at the number of words that children are exposed to by the time they get to school, not different words, but just the sheer number of words. You know, somebody's gone to the trouble of counting them. There's a three million gap between high socioeconomic status and low socioeconomic status families. You know. And we know that you need words, exposure, to understand what language is about and to understand what language tells you about the world. So children start school behind linguistically. How do we deal with that? Um, we divide our schools into deciles, 10 deciles, high and low socioeconomic status. Okay, this is, decile one is a low status <coughs> school, decile 10 is a high status school. Okay, <coughs> on that gradation. How do the kids perform in those different schools? The, the, the only difference is, sorry, I can't say the only difference, but the main difference is socioeconomic status. This is looking at their performance on science. The score, average score for children from the high status schools, the high decile school, 547. Just take that figure. Now we go down to those children from the low socioeconomic status school. Look, 120 points. And you can see a very even gradient of performance on this particular test. Okay, so socioeconomic status in New Zealand clearly has a major impact. Another piece of research looked at the performance on the science tests and <coughs> compared it with the number of objects in the family home. Remember I described my early experience, no, no books, 
certainly no TV, but if we take the contemporary situation, this would include books, TV, computer, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and so they've done a study to compare the number of objects like that in the home, where they've got four or more high scores, where they've got zero or perhaps one um, low scores. So it's related then to the number of stimulating objects in the family home. Of course, we've got uh, ability differences, and I think that's the common factor of today's conference. Um, unfortunately, not a great deal of research has been done to evaluate um, or to assess ability differences in performance. Um, although I, I think that Nils's work is probably an exception to that, but. Uh, I couldn't understand all of it or any of it, but I got the impression that um, you were doing some work there. So let's just quickly have a look at ability differences. That is an issue. Um, US data show that um, two thirds of children with disabilities score below the 25th percentile, okay? Right down in the bottom performances on standardised tests. Um, let's look at the UK data. Um, there is general agreement that special education, special, um, education needs and disabled students here have low achievement and that they are eight times, that's an enormous figure, uh, eight times more likely to be excluded from school on behavioural grounds but um, perhaps on others too. Let's be a bit more encouraging. <laughs> um, now, um, this is um, the English version of the book that you, 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 were, uh, you have, uh, the one that's just been published, um, and I've called it in the English version, The Ecology of Inclusive Education. Um, talk about that in a minute. Um, it has 78 strategies, uh, only 60 in the Danish version. Uh, we trust you with them, or the way out more in England, the English version. Now, the way in which I've thought about putting these strategies into together um, is using this. Um, ecological model. You will be familiar, I think, some of you, with the work of Yuri Bronfenbrenner. Mm -hmm. Yes, Sidmans. Uh, he talked about the ecology of human development. So I've kind of taken this idea, but a bit different. He has concentric circles, and you'll notice that I've used the spiral. And I think that's quite significant it's because I want to significant because I wanted to show that there are connections and no boundaries between the different elements. And my basic argument, which I will just illustrate in a moment, with what time I've got, is that we've got to look at um, the child in its context. We've got to look at the child in the family unit the child in that classroom, the day-to-day, minute-by-minute interaction with other kids and the teacher. We've got to look at the child in the school. The school has a unique culture. Each school has a unique culture. Then we've got to look at the community and look at the bureaucracy. Uh, that's the Ministry and Department of Education in various countries. Then we've got to look at it at the society. Let me just say that my basic argument here is that we cannot take a piecemeal approach to the problem that I have, problems I have identified. By that I mean we just can't say, oh yeah, here are some things we must do in the classroom and forget about all the rest of it. Similarly, we can't just take something at the school level, bureaucracy level. <coughs> My essential argument is that we've got to approach this 
as a system-wide challenge. And we've got to address ways in which we can improve the situation at all different levels. I tell a story about a man going on, this is from the book of Buddha, he goes on a journey, comes to a river, very wide, very deep, and he looks around and he sees some logs of wood, and he manages to tie them together, and he made a raft. And he paddled across the river, okay, got to the other side, and you know what he did? He lifted up that raft, and he put it on his back, and he carried it around forever, up the mountains, across the deserts. He carried the raft around. Why? Because he was so grateful it worked. And he wanted to keep it always, not to change. Teachers do this. They carry rafts. You might too. Ideas that used to work but no longer work. My argument is that we've got to examine very critically what we are doing and discard those ideas which are no longer working. And for goodness sake, we are continuing to do the same thing over and over again, even though, as Einstein said, that's a sign if we do the same thing over and over again and expect a different outcome, he says that's a sign of insanity. <laughs> so are we being insane as educators if, you know, we continue to do the same thing but get no results? We must be because these results are staying with us. So we've got to change. We've got to look at different ways of doing things, and we've got to look at them right across the boards. Let me just take a few of them. They're all in your book, so we won't need to go through all of them. How are we going for time? Ten, Ten minutes. Right, we'll have to get through a few of them, won't we? Um, <clears throat> as you can see, I've um, marked and read a few that I think are very important. Um, I've already mentioned a couple, I just want to remind you of them. Remember I started off with the notion of respect, you know, for different cultures. That was a word that I think is critical if we find that through. Then I went on to another word that was important, expectation. Boy, that's important. Let's go on to some of the others. We've got to look at human rights. Those pictures that I gave you of those gaps in the performances, those awful gaps. They're an infringement on human rights. You know, let's look at human rights. It goes back to 1948 after World War II when Eleanor Roosevelt and others um, developed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Powerful, powerful statement. All are, e this is what it says, all are equal before the law and are entitled without any discrimination to equal protection of the law. You know, have I portrayed equality in those graphs and so on? I don't think so. Then we go through to all of the conventions, many of them, that have been developed since the Universal Declaration in 1948. Let's take one. The 1960 Convention Against Discrimination in Education. The title tells you, doesn't it, what it's involved with. Um, but we, in effect, must have discrimination in education if those results continue. Then we bring it up to date and we look <coughs> at the uh, UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, which incidentally, in, um, nice to see you guys. See you, see you. Bye. Bye. Um, 
the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. And I hope that's something that you are all very familiar with and use as a basis for argument with all sorts of people. Um, Article 24, very important, that involves um, inclusion. I focus on inclusion. So there's a good starting point. We've got to accept and implement our human rights legislation. Where are we? Strategy two, um, yeah. I am diabetic. I am very grateful to scientists who discovered the properties of insulin. I'm very grateful to my doctors who know about insulin and have prescribed it and have kept me going. <laughs> Couldn't we expect teachers to be just as knowledgeable about science under, underlying their profession? Isn't, isn't that a reasonable expectation that we expect teachers to use evidence to base their practice on what research tells us? and also to gather data to show that their practice is effective and is contributing to changing those terrible statistics. Isn't that a reasonable expectation? You know? um, that's the second point. Um, early is important. Um, inclusive education. That's what we gathered here for, I think, to focus on that. Um, I'm a very strong advocate of inclusion, as you might gather. <clears throat> but what does it mean? Unfortunately, it's too often seen as just placement, putting kids into a regular class. That's a necessary but not sufficient condition. Inclusion to me is a multifaceted concept where it's not only placement but it is appropriate curriculum, appropriate assessment, appropriate pedagogy, acceptance, the provision of appropriate resources. So it's a package deal. Okay. And that's what I've written about in some of my books and have lectured about, I think, when I've been here in the past. <coughs> no, no question about uh, inclusion being necessary. Um, another point that I'm going to make is the importance of gathering data. But I've talked about disaggregated data. By that I mean, think of the strand work in the UK where he has gathered data to show the intersection of those different uh, perspectives, gender, ethnicity, and social class. So we need, certainly at a school level, and most definitely at a system level, a municipality level, um, to gather data on the performance of our various subgroups. And of course, that should lead to action. Um, I think I've just about run out of time, haven't I? <laughs> one minute. Oh. I wonder what we could talk about there. Yeah, I'm going to talk about number 24 at the top here. Okay? Year of Science. Because that's going to be increasingly important for us as educators to understand what neuroscience is going to tell us about um, learning, about the capacity of children to learn, and so on. Um, so we're dealing with the 10 billion 
cells, and neurons in our brains. And this is my brain, it's now trying to connect with your brain, and I hope to connect with some of the neural pathways, to strengthen some of them, to perhaps create some new ones. As time goes by, what do we know? Just a few things, very quickly. I'm going to take perhaps another 60 seconds. Um, first of all, we know a lot about the specific functions of different parts of the brain. Parts of the brain that control language, that control movement, that control cognitive processes, etc., 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 and that influence emotions. Um, so we know about that. The second thing we know is that um, it used to be thought if you damage your brain, that's too bad because the brain doesn't repair. That's wrong. Especially with young people, the brain is malleable. It is plastic. It can find alternative pathways. And we must never write off people if they have been defined as having a brain injury. And that can happen even with people who are older. So that's the second thing. Third thing is the saying that neurons that fire together wire together. So the more we can get neurons connecting with each other, you know, that's what happens. The neurons in our brain connecting with each other across the dendrites. Okay. The more that, that happens through practice, experience, the more likely they are going to wire together and stay together. Okay. Related to that is the phrase, use it or lose it. Okay. We don't use particular patterns in our brain, then they will wither and die and be pruned, as they say. And the last point I'll make is the issue that as children develop, they go through sensitive periods. Particularly if we think of young children under the age of four, when they are, as you all know as parents and people who observe young kids, they're learning language. If they're exposed to another bit, aren't they? So that's a sensitive period. Learn, being exposed to language so that they can make the rules, not formal, but speak as though they know what the rules of grammar are, so they have a sense of period. That's why we've got to look at early intervention to make sure that children are being exposed to experiences, and particularly in this case, language. Boy, we didn't get far through that list, did we? But you can go away and read about it. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to finish with a poem. It's in one of my books. Come to the edge, he said. They refused. Come to the edge, he said. They came. He pushed them. They flew. Fly. 